Hello and a very warm welcome to the British Library food season, which is generously supported by KitchenAid. My name is Angela Clutton. I had the huge pleasure of being the guest director of the food season, working with Polly Russell, who founded the food season four years ago and is its curator. We have a very special event today, not just because it's a final event of this year's food season, but because it's a collaboration with a brilliant youth activist organisation, Fight Back 2030. You're about to watch a film that Fight Back made with us, focusing on issues around youth obesity and our food environment. That film is going to be followed by discussion of the issues and looking ahead to possible solutions. A little housekeeping before we get started. There are tabs on screen where you can give feedback on the event or perhaps make a donation to support the work of the British Library. This event is pre-recorded, so you can't leave a question for our panel, but underneath this video, you should find social media links so you can carry on the conversation there. Now though, let's turn to Bite Back 2030, and here's Jamie Oliver to tell you more. Hi guys, what can I tell you about Bite Back? Well, first up, Bite Back is a proper youth-led movement. There's no adults telling kids what to do, it's the other way around. We founded it because we've got a massive health issue in the UK. One in three children leave primary school overweight or with obesity. And if you live in a disadvantaged area, you're twice as likely to be affected. But we believe that we can fix things through putting child health back at the center of the food system. So what does that actually look like in reality? Well, we have to make sure that all young people, wherever they live, can find and afford healthy, nutritious food. That means taking junk food out of the spotlight and using the power of marketing and advertising to shine a light on healthier options instead. And it also means doing more to make sure that kids have safe spaces to hang out and eat healthily. But most of all, it means listening, and I mean really listening, to the brilliant young people themselves and making them part of the change. At Bite Back, we have some awesome young campaigners who are leading this fight and sharing their own experiences of being a teen in the UK right now. Please, please support them in any way you can and thank you for taking the time to listen. Here's their incredible leader, Christina. Hi, my name is Christina. I'm the co-chair of a youth board at Bite Back 2030, which is a movement fighting for a fairer food system. Today, I'm here at Oval, where I have invited one of the fiercest food critics in London, Giles Corrin, to see what it's like living in a place like this. Let's go meet him. Pleasure. Is there something that you're used to? I'm used to walking past them. I don't know about going in. Uh, but you get that's everywhere, isn't it? You know, just rows of chicken shops and Chinese and, and, and whatnot. Yeah, and full of school kids, sadly. Yeah, so where would you usually shop? I, I would probably, I sort of, you, online, Ocado or something. And then, I mean, we've got, to be honest, at the top of my road, there's a butcher and a greengrocer and a baker. I go up there and buy food. If I was eating cooked food, it would probably be in a restaurant. Okay. Maybe the odd kebab when I'm drunk. But I mean, I've got to say that I, I will, I'm not a kind of daytime user of your high street chicken shop, really. Well, why don't we try one out now? Yeah? Yeah, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> Uh, I have your, your delivery. Yeah. I have what you ordered. You want a chicken burger? I, 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 that's a delicious. <laughs> How does this compare to what you had yesterday? Ah, it's a little less green. <laughs> I don't know, it certainly confirms what they've told me about young people and their terrible eating habits. <laughs> We're acting as if we have a choice. Do you not? No, not at all. We're in a food desert, so there's no other healthy... When you say a food desert, mm -hmm. what do you mean? A food desert is essentially a place where there's 
extreme limitations on how much healthy options and nutritious food there is compared to how much junk food there is. On the high street here, you see loads of chicken shops, loads of Chinese takeaways, but you don't see any you know, sandwich shops or any healthy Pratt's and Leon's at an affordable price. All these, you know, kind of fancy, like, uh, healthy stores are, are expensive. It's like 10 pounds for a meal. Um, so they can't afford it either. And it's, it's not accessible. You don't see it on the high street. Out of 10, what would you give it after you finish? <laughs> when you mark something out of 10, it's a question of what you think it's aspiring to. So it's not trying to be a delicious, healthy meal with vegetables and fiber and stuff. It's trying to be, it's quite tasty. It's salty, it's tangy. This pretend artificial mayonnaise made from E numbers and emulsifiers and various terrible mm -hmm. chemicals is making my tongue think that it's food. The bread is nice and stodgy. I'm getting a sugar rush. There's certainly no complicated dark colored things that I might have to actually digest. It's going straight into my blood. I won't have an Imagine oh. having that every day after school. Could you do that? Having one of these every day? I feel like if I, did, if I had it one every day, yeah. I might never poo again. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's not, it's, it's the kind of thing which wants a warning on it saying not to be eaten as part of a Right, and that's the, that's the key thing. So would you be happy if your kids ate that every day after school? Um, no, of course not. No, of course not. I wouldn't be happy. My kids are like seven and 10, so at this stage, they, they can't choose for themselves. So they, well, my daughter who's 10 goes out and goes to the shops a bit and then comes back with fizzy drinks and chocolate, but she's not, they're not yet at a stage where they're buying their own food on the way home from school. And certainly my, my where I live is the, the school at the top of the road and the bottom of the road, and there's a lot of chicken shops and pizza joints around them. And I'm aware that kids are living on that and not looking all that healthy. And it's, it is, yes, it isn't what I'd want for my kids. So Jacob, do you spend, do you spend a lot of time in chicken shops? Yeah, um, I know a lot of my friends go during their free periods, they go and get chicken, they go get it for lunch. Um, it's just, we literally go all the time. It's literally, it's almost every day for someone. Do, do you go there to, to hang out as much as well yeah, as to eat? That, that's, is it a nice place to be? It's, I mean, we don't really have anywhere else to go. We just get on a bus, go to sit and we walk around. Go it's walk the only warm, the dry place, right? Yeah. And that's, really? that's the problem. We don't get a choice because of all the manipulation from advertising. So, yeah, it's fun to have a burger sometimes with your friends when you're going out, but not every day, not every time we leave school, not every time, you know, we leave our house and get bombarded and with... Do people you know eat only this? Yes, all the time, since we were, like, in year six. Jacob, when was the last time an advertisement got you to buy junk food? Oh... It was um, a couple of weeks ago. I came, I got the like mama's text, and and that made a really, really crave pizza. I've been craving pizza for a while since then. On my phone, I've got 17 photos here of all the instances where, like, pretty recently, where me and some of the other youth board members um, have found adverts. I've got McDonald's and Uber Eats advert. So is this coming to you on social? That that's just through the letterbox. So that, that's yeah? through the letterbox. Here, I got a notification to my phone, 50% off of Uber Eats. To so your phone, even though you're how old? I'm 16. I'm a child. These businesses are targeting children when legally that's not allowed. So they're getting away with How all are they this. doing that? Because if you, you're 16, you probably understand how the internet works, and I don't. Is that because you've been searching Google for fast it's food? It's because and it I've knows? got the app. I've got the Uber Eats app because obviously I'm going to have that app because right. I want to order myself some food. But they shouldn't be able to send me these sort of things. Costa. And this is in a world where child health and child obesity is a major issue. Yeah. You look healthy enough. You could get a bit more sun, but apart from that, I mean, well, how come you, you you clearly ignore these ads? Do you, or do you succumb to them? No, I, I see these ads all the time. It definitely impacts me. I definitely see, uh, for example, posts like this. This is Anton. He was a Love Island star. Um, this is him sitting on his couch. This came up on my feed. He doesn't look Anton. very nice, though. You want to be like him? <laughs> you don't see adverts, Barack, do you? For like, well, for no one's advertising salad. No, I'm just wondering when the last time maybe you've seen one. Of, and how like, for healthy food? Yeah. It's it just they just don't do it, and it's because there isn't the margin. You know, if you with pizzas, there's something like a ninety percent profit margin on them. I mean, I have thought about it before. Wouldn't it be crazy if you saw posters? I'm loving it, and if someone's eating an apple. Yeah, I think it influences people in the same way that it does now to eat healthy food because it's in front of you. We want to ban junk food advertising entirely, or just at times online and yeah. around, um, and we want to put healthy eating in the spotlight. Um, but that requires the cooperation of these big businesses um, to actually, you know, prioritise our health. Do you want to, you want to change the culture where people think it's all right to eat this food? Is that the main thing? And it's, you think that starts young? 
Yeah, um, but we also want to reimagine our high streets. It's almost like giving back control to the people because when you look around and all you see is adverts, you, you're not making the decisions yourself. And it really does impact like the decisions you make and what you eat. And maybe if there were more healthy adverts, it would change like how people buy. Yeah, you know, it's, it's easier to stop things and discourage things than it is to encourage things. It's You can't, I mean, it would have to be a government advert and they would argue they've got their five vegetables, whatever it is, five portions campaign. I think, I think you, you should probably suppress the advertising, shouldn't you? You should suppress the representation by big business. But governments are unwilling to do that. You know, they, they, they lobby, don't they? They, they? they get their money from the big corporations. Businesses will always prioritise their income, their, their money first. But we also want to make it a massive aim of theirs to prioritise child health. Like the fact that, you know, on our youth board and our youth leaders, all of us have like a universal kind of um, experience with with food deserts and just not being able to pick healthy food not having healthy options we managed to sit down with Tesco and Nestle recently and Jacob you asked them a question didn't you yeah um, I asked them about their responsibilities uh, to do with their advertising and um, we had like a little box of one of Nestle cereals I can't remember which one it was I think it was like Nesquik or something like that uh, we had the box there we were literally looking at the nutritional information um, I think it was ridiculous amounts of sugar in like and um, we asked them why do you do this do you target towards children and they just went no we don't and go well you've got cartoon characters on the box on these high fat sugar salt products do you not think that that's targeting towards children and they basically just said no every single time we asked them if they'd pledged to changing that and changing the way that they advertise and again they just said no. So do you think they should have plain packaging? Because they've done that with cigarettes, which used to have pretty colours and now don't. Plain packaging on cereals and chocolates and that, would that help? I'm sure you've been in a supermarket and you've, like with your kids, and they'll see something that they like. Yeah. Based on, you know, it having relevance to their lives, maybe Elsa is on the front of something. And like how you obviously, you can attain to how that influences. Oh, dad, can I buy this? Oh, can we get that? That's really cool. It's like Peppa Pig and Thomas the Engine chocolates. That's obviously marketing towards children. And it puts, unfortunately, it puts a parent in the position of having to say no all the time, which is a narrative exactly. that parents like me don't really want to have. You don't really want to tell your kids no. So it'd be nice, wait, well, you have to sometimes, but you want it because it'd be nice to narrow the number of times. Do you think it would be useful to have cartoon characters on healthy products? Like, put it on, I don't know, put them on a piece of they broccoli? They would be, they used to. When I, Popeye, when I was a kid, Popeye used to sell a lot of spinach. Do they not do that? I don't see a lot of children's culture. Is there not a thing, is there not some some rabbit that says he's a lot of carrots or anything like that? No, the rabbit's on Nesquik and that's a chocolate <laughs> puff puff cereal. Really? So, yeah. It's the same with McDonald's, it's kind of scary. They put in those iPads with games and stuff and now you have these big tables. Do they? Yeah, yeah you can sit. They've got games on iPads. Yeah. And play games in McDonald's. Right. So you buy your one pound chips and you sit there with all your friends, almost like you're at school again. And you all get to sit, you know, and talk and play games. And it's like, well, if this is the culture that you're like pushing at us, how are we going to grow and like beyond that? Exactly. I think it's also good to say these games that are on the, like the iPads, they're for like six year olds. The games that are on there, they're just like games for five, six, seven year olds. Like they're really, really like, small children games they're like not they weren't they're not games that we would all play we kind of go and sit on them because you know it's a bit of a joke so that's designed to get like six or seven year olds and then their mums can sit there and they don't have to worry about yeah them and they just sit there the they're just eating their chips whilst playing the games on the ipads the industry knows what they're doing when they're putting toys cartoons all this it like junk food stores within 400 meters of our schools like they know that they're marketing to kids and that has to stop yeah there seems to be a lot of things converging on kids kind of forcing them to eat this junk. Exactly. Whether it's the, it's the advertising, then there's nowhere else to go, and then there isn't even anything else to do. Exactly. If, we, if the government helped us reinvent our high streets, you know, subsidise healthy food so there were actually kind of competitive, um, there was competition with these cheap, cheap junk food, um, we would go to those healthy places. They act like we don't want to eat healthy. They act like we immediately are drawn to these these junk food, um, burgers and chickens and whatnot. No, like we, we want the opportunity to be healthy. And if the government actually were able to help us um, transform our high streets, then it would be a much safer and better place for all of us. What about school food? Do they, do they not feed you properly? I wouldn't describe my school food as healthy by Was there a healthy means. option? Was there an alternative to eat anything? Not really. There was a time when we 
So at our school council, we have like a few representatives from each tutor group and everyone feeds into those school councillors and they feed back into like the top of the school and everything. Um, everyone throughout my year group was very, very like keen to have a salad bar. That was something that we really, really wanted. Um, it took us like a good couple of months for them to go, okay, yeah, we'll put a lovely salad bar in there. They put it in there and basically they took a bunch of leaves, chucked them in a bowl, got some olive oil, a little bit of vinegar, there you go, that's it, salad bar. It was there for two weeks and they got rid of it. It's interesting, in this sort of food history TV shows and everything that I've done, the, 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 the thing is, is that over the last 40 or 50 years, the world is largely because of the march of capitalism. The world is perceived to have been better. It looks like we have more choice, and we're always told that with the, you know the food from all over the world and all these different possibilities compared to the kind of grey, grisly food that was available rationing, which went on until 1954 and then all through the 60s and 70s. But the thing is, the obesity crisis has risen with it, so it's gone completely unregulated. So there have been lots of great, colourful, lovely things. The problem is, you then now have to rein it back. Is you have to put what you're saying is you have to put the genie back in the bottle a little bit. Yeah, don't you? we've we've now got. Um more homogenous diets than ever, we're all eating the same three grains. That's because we're eating burgers, chicken, burgers, chicken, burgers. Like there's no, if, if you got like 20 of us young kids from any random class in any random school in the UK, and you asked them what they were gonna eat, I guarantee you at least 80% of them would say a junk food item because we haven't explored with food. We don't know what nutrition is. No one's taught us, we don't have the option. It's, it's tragic, really. One in three kids are obese in the UK. That doesn't just come out of nowhere. So do you think then you, you three are representative? I mean, in terms of you care about it? Do, or or are, you, are your friends mostly just chopping the fried chicken down and not really caring? Or is, is, would, would they be open to it if there was more healthy stuff available? I think it's, it's a mix of both. As, as kids, we like having control. And so when you tell us that we're not actually in control, despite us thinking that we're making our own decisions, the uproar you get is, is immense. It's crazy. It's, it's beautiful, honestly. And so when my friends like, found out about what I was doing, the, like, and I taught them about it, educated them, they were more, you know, in, like, wanted to see change and wanting to see a difference made because they felt out of control. The issue is that we're not being heard. There is, a, there is a generational problem, apart from anything else, whether there's issues of geography, or issues of social class, issues of money. You know, mostly, people of my age, 50, don't really understand teenagers. We, so we just assume, ah, oh, they, they, they just want to eat fried chicken. We don't probably give it as much, anything like as much thought as we do. And then we think, well, we, kids don't listen to us anyway. I mean, not that I'm a lawmaker or anything, but if, you know, I could tell them what to do, but my children don't listen to me. Why on earth would two, three, sorry? kids that I, you know, that I just met in the park, why would you possibly want to listen to me? It's, it's, it's difficult. You do tend to think about your own little bubble. I mean, I look out in the world and I try and think, I write about obesity from time to time. I know about grown-ups and I know about little kids. So I, I, I write quite often about the problems of feeding 10-year-olds, but that's very different from teenagers who are free agents, have a bit of money, not a lot, but you have some and you can get out. And there's this gap between school and home where we don't know what goes on. And that's obviously when the eating gets done. And obviously much worse things. I mean, that I worry about. My, so, so I now, re I probably would go home and look at the world slightly more through your eyes. I mean, I would, I'm going to go home and so either to cook a delicious meal for myself or maybe my wife will have cooked something, something nice and healthy for my kids or go to a nice restaurant if one opened. So I can walk past all the disgusting looking fast food outlets and the stupid McDonald's adverts with, you know, I'm loving it and some horrible, scary, sugary thing. It doesn't really impact on me. But if I think, oh, if I only had, I had three pounds in my pocket and nothing to do for two hours and home wasn't even very nice, I'm, where I would go, I would probably follow my nose that way. So yes, no, I would look at it, look at it differently. Well, we'll have to go and do a restaurant review together or yeah, something. Yeah, 100%. Although I possibly that. I should choose one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree.
Thank you so much to Bite Back for that film, um, in particular to Christina, Jacob and Barakat, and of course, Giles Corrin too. Um, I feel that film puts an unerring light on the problems that too many young people face. And we thought rather than just end it there, it might be interesting to delve a little more into the issues and maybe think too about some solutions. So we have gathered together what's a terrific panel to debate all of that for us now. Um, I'm just going to introduce them. We have Paul Lindley, an entrepreneur and author, the founder of Ella's Kitchen Baby Food Brand. Paul lives his life inspired and focused on the belief that we can build communities, businesses and societies that are richer in opportunity, compassion and ideas. Paul is the chair of the London Child Obesity Task Force and I should say is also an ambassador for the British Library's Business and IP Centre. Tasha Mahakiora, board member of Bite Back 2030, having previously been on Bite Back's youth board and she was part of last year's British Library food season. Tasha is an asylum seeker from Zimbabwe, now living in Lewisham and at Warwick University. Tasha is passionate about changing the way we talk about obesity and creating equal opportunities for everyone to have access to healthier food options. Thomasina Myers, chef, food writer and co-founder of the Oaxaca Restaurants. As a campaigner, she's worked with organisations including Chefs and Schools, Centrepoint, Women of Women International and the Soil Association. A great panel being led by a wonderful person, Rosie Boycott, Baroness Rosie Boycott, crossbench peer. But, uh, Rosie used to run the London Food Board, and before that, she was a newspaper editor and journalist, still a journalist. She is the chair of Feeding Britain and Veg Power, a trustee of the Food Foundation, and a patron of Sustain. So we have a lot of incredible people with great ideas and passion and making things happen. We're in great hands, and there's a lot to talk about. Rosie, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for those lovely introductions, and it's a uh... It's terrific to be here and I was absolutely overawed by the film. I thought it was a really well made and full of lots of detail that you don't sadly often get. Um, I do want to ask everybody's views about that, but the, the things that leapt out for me were very much the feeling that we need these chicken and chip shops for reasons that are not to do with food. They're to do with a place to go, they're to do with poverty in people's lives and the questions of advertising and no choice. So, Tasha, um, you are part of Bite Back, so, and you and I have spoken before about this. I mean, what do you feel, why do you feel that the, the chicken, you know, you talked about food deserts. When, when you talk about food desert, what do you mean and how does the chicken and chip shop play this crucial role within it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think when we talk about food deserts, essentially it's any area um, that has limited access to fresh food um, and veg or nutritious food. So whether that's you don't have access to your um, a supermarket and you have to rely on perhaps corner stores um, or whether you don't have access to like a food market where you can have fresh fruit and vegetable, that would be considered a food desert. And I think the film really captures a lot of young people's experience with the food environment where they don't have access to these kinds of food and therefore have to rely on their local, you know, fast food stores and when we think about you know these kind of high streets that food deserts have a lot of the time they are plagued with uh, fast food junk food stores so it's you don't have that option to think okay I have an option between a burger and chips or you know a salad bowl you don't have that salad bowl so you automatically go for that um, junk food um, option but I also think in terms of how we use junk food, like um, how we use the fast food stores, like you said, we're not going there because we actually want these food. A lot of the time, it's just a social um, um, a social environment for us. So we go there after school, we go there to go meet with friends. When it's cold and rainy outside, that is the place that we go to and automatically we just buy food. It's, just, it's a social event for us. And I think that is what's different and what a lot of older people perhaps can't relate to because obviously growing up for the older generation you had all these open spaces all these community clubs clubs that were available that's no longer an option for us so we're relying on these stores to just meet with friends have a little laugh and just enjoy I mean money also plays quite a big role here because I can remember talking to people and saying well why don't you go to Costa and someone looked at me like I was bonkers and said well it's nearly three pounds for a cup of coffee and then they kick you out after you've drunk the cup of coffee. So it, it is an issue of poverty, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. So we think about, you know, how um, fast foods are priced. They're priced at a lot a lower price than any healthier alternative. So as a student, you just know 
it's it makes sense for me to buy the six wins and chips for two pounds because I get a full meal and I'm able to get an affordable price but versus you know a, a healthier option that's priced at you know five six pounds um so in terms of it's also convenient like I said it's really close to your school or, or close to your home uh but the price point doesn't you know encourage you to choose a better option as well all these different factors play in into the supposed choice that you have so, Paul, coming to you, and um, congratulations with the London Obesity Task Force. You put forward all sorts of incredibly good recommendations, but somehow a lot of what Tasha's just said gets to the heart of so many problems, doesn't it, that are like really hard to push and move. Absolutely. Thank you, Rosie, and congratulations on Tasha. It's such a powerful film. Um, and I think it really makes it clear that too many of our children and young people face the risk of lifelong ill health just because of the circumstances in which they live their lives. It makes it difficult for them to eat healthy food, drink plenty of water and be physically active day to day to day. And I think as we've just touched on, those causes span all sorts of things, but fundamentally poverty and jobs and housing, high streets, transport, advertising, loads more, all sort of environmental type stuff. They're all interlinked and complicated, but they all make it harder for families, for children, young people to eat well, and be physically active and just looking at that film I just thought it was fantastic because not only does it highlight all those things but it also shows that the power of talking and listening to people young people especially and the power of lived experience you know if we're going to solve anything we want to ask the people who live closest to where the problem is and anything to for, for solutions they'll know the solutions better so you know those people living in difficult environments <coughs> excuse me and um, uh, those those people care. I mean, that came out from the film. Young people care. They have ideas. They have articulate voices, and they are a power for, for change. So I'm, I'm optimistic, actually, that although we've got a really complicated and deep problem, that we've got the wherewithal to think of solutions, and let's hope we've got the bravery to act upon them. So just just staying with them. I mean, the, this question of how this always used to torment me, and when I ran the London Food Board, you know, this question of being able to pass a law that says no new chicken and chip shop within 400 meters of the school but of course it couldn't touch the ones that were already there and are you able um, now with new power mayoral powers in any way to say that the chicken and chip shop also has to offer a commensurately priced healthy option and in a way push it forward or or is it one of those lunatic things that the salad always remains behind because the yeah. chicken and chips are just so delicious well, the mayor doesn't have those powers to do that right now. What he has had the power is to convene all the councils and central government and the leaders in London to, um, <clears throat> to begin to act. And he has, as you say, uh, put restrictions in for, for new planning commission for uh, fast food restaurants within 400 metres of school. And he's also taken, which is a world's first, the, um, the opportunity to um, ban effectively high fat, high salt, high sugar advertising from the entire uh, Transport for London estate, mm -hmm. uh, which central government hopefully will follow up with now with, with the watershed on television, with online advertising. Let's hope they're brave to do that. Um, but, you know, as, as we started this conversation, the, the chicken shops in themselves aren't the bad thing. It's, it's what's sold. So, for example, one of the uh, recommendations from our report call to action is that when uh, after school and before school when there's going to be a lot of children in, in the uh, chicken shops that um, the the owners can't um, put on promotions and discount food and give a free chips or upsize chips or whatever um, in, in that time frame but it's a recommendation and it will need to be to, to be to be thought through but you know in many ways this is similar to the sort of climate change challenge and the, the challenge we've got to move to a green economy. You know, if we're trying to move to a healthy economy, the government ought to be stepping in and being able to support small businesses to be able to make that transition. These small businesses may have to change their, you know, their capital equipment, their cookers and their, their fryers and, and, and help make, um, grill, get grillers in, for example. Their supply chains are going to have to be looked at, their margins and their business plans. And if we're serious as a society and we, we elect a government that we want to, to make these changes, they've got to be brave and they've got to be able to help these businesses do the right thing uh, and provide not only a safe space for, for young people, but also healthier foods. Well, that's, that's super interesting. I really agree with that. I hadn't thought of it quite like how much we need government subsidy to help those transitions be made. But we also, Tommy, we also need, I mean, one of the things that I, I think comes up is that 
a lot of kids get don't get a good meal. So therefore, you're still super hungry at half past four when you're drifting home. And at Paul, as Paul says, this is a moment that a lot of these places pounce and they give you free chips or they give you incredible discounts or for that. And so I wanted to ask you about two things. One is about the importance of a, a good meal and how your chefs in school program is going. But then also to move to talking about advertising, because that is the other big thing in that uh, in that film, and it is something that the government is trying to think about. So over to you. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think, yeah, Bite Bat is such an incredible charity. And I think um, what Paul said is completely right. And, and hearing it straight from the horse's mouth from these young people who are forced to live in these situations is so important for the government to keep listening to those people. Um, I think there are really interesting um, parallels between how we tackle climate change and how we tackle obesity because they're very linked as Paul touched on them too um you know in 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 Oaxaca now we've got 50 percent of our menu is vegetarian and actually that's translated to 50 percent of our sales are also vegetarian and I think things like that are really important because we have to eat less meat and the problem is a lot of these chicken shops is they're only offering you know, protein and we know that protein is chicken that's been fed soy that comes from the Amazon. Mm -hmm. So not only is it destroying the rainforest and our climate change and our quest to keep global warming down to you know 1.5 or 2, 2 degrees, but it's also then impacting childhood health, which costs the NHS at the moment £6 billion every year. Now imagine if you could take that £6 billion and put it to good use. Mm -hmm. And some of the things I think would be really good is to tax bad um, practice and and reward good practice so for instance even how you cook which we also touched Paul touched upon how you cook something so if you deep fat fry chicken all the oil you're using that oil also comes from places like the Amazon basin so that in itself is a bad practice um, but also it, you know helps to contribute to obesity so there should be some way where food all food business now are starting to be rewarded by the percentage of their menu that's vegetarian because this stuff is really important. We don't have very much time to act on it, and it contributes directly to public health. Because I, mean, I interrupt that. I want. I'm really interested in your notion of how you would tax and reward around that. I mean, how do you see that actually? How do you see that happening? Well, I don't. So I think there needs to be there needs to be some kind of taxation system. And I think and I think if you if you because right now all restaurants are having to start starting to put nutritionals on our menu so we're now looking at all our calorie intake but the main focus is on calories so if i make a delicious bean tostada which has got some avocado some hodma dodds locally grown organic beans and pulses it's quite nutritionally dense so it's right. packed it's got calories in it so that's if that's the only measure that i can say on my menu but what it doesn't say is how much fiber it's got and one of the biggest um, contributors to bad health, which kills 90,000 people every year in this country now, poor health or diet related disease, is our lack of fibre. Because all the food in those chicken shops got no fibre in it. Mm -hmm. So if we could start measuring food on things like fibre instead of calories, which we know is a real thing to, to contributing to good health, um, then I think that would be a really good point. I think the other point to address is where these young people go. They've got no spaces, no community spaces. You know, right near me on the Harrow Road, there was an amazing boxing club. It's been forced to shut down. There's another community centre that's, you know, hand to mouth. The government has got to plough some of this £6 billion a year they've got to play with, ploughing them back into community centres. And then the other thing is affordability, which I'm really interested in with the chefs in schools. So our model of putting a chef into a school and transforming an entire school, 600 kids and how they eat and eating proper, nutritionally dense food, because we've got to start looking at the nutrition in food, because there's no point in feeding kids when what they're getting doesn't fill them up, doesn't give them any goodness, and they're leaving, you know, with a poor diet. And we know that the poor diet is costing them, and it's costing, you know, six billion is just childhood obesity. It, the figure goes much, much higher if you look at adult obesity, not even to mention the COVID crisis, because the um, the International Obesity um, Foundation did a report that came out in March that showed across the world high levels of obesity and even being overweight. So in countries like the UK, the US and Italy, where over half the adult population overweight had the highest um, COVID yeah. uh, casualty. So that is a linear line that we can draw. So, but how do we stop that when children can't afford or young people can't afford to eat well? And I'm really interested in turning 
every single local area has got a primary school. And I can see through what we do in Latin schools. We've got these amazing kitchens. There are primary schools with kitchens and the ones that don't have kitchens should have kitchens installed. Why can't those places become community centres after hours? You could do a double service, for instance, and then they become public canteens. I'm really interested in this idea. It might sound socialist, but how else do you get our nation eating well? Because we've got a, a complete lack of skills gap. We've got people who do not know how to cook. We've got affordable housing with no, no proper kitchens. Mm -hmm. They've got you know, tiny kitchens with a room for a microwave. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we get people eating well when they're, they're in the food desert? They've got no fresh um, fruit and vegetables next to them. It's inaffordable in, in any case. So it should be subsidised because we know right now that processed food, ultra processed food, is heavily subsidised by um, in farming because it's growing wheat and corn crops that are heavily subsidised. So that food is artificially cheap. Like the chicken shop food should not be that cheap because we know it's extremely detrimental to 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 the environment. So I think there are masses of solutions there, and I know I've packed a lot of them, them in there in those short. That's Tommy, that was a brilliant answer, but I'm good. I still want to just before we go into a bit more of a free-for-all, <coughs> I just want to get to this issue of the perniciousness of the advertising. Yeah. Um, Tasha, do you want to, Tasha and Paul, maybe both of you, because you both made, um, I'm, I'm just interested, Tasha, how does it affect you? And Paul, would you then say how you see solutions? Yeah, I think advertising plays a huge role in terms of what young people choose um, to eat, whether that's something that they order in or where they go out to meet friends, the kind of food that they pick on the menu. Um, I think the film did really well. Jacob showed how he's literally targeted and bombarded by these um, large um, fast food corporations, whether that's on Instagram or being sent direct messages that, oh, hey, we have an offer for you here. I think that plays a huge role into the kind of foods that people are eating, especially when you also have on top of that, you your favorite social media influencers being endorsed by these um, um, these food companies again it ultimately and we don't want to you know underestimate how much advertisement plays um, in society you know these companies don't spend millions upon millions on advertising for no reason they know it works and they know that when they're targeting young people who are so um, impressionable and so vulnerable we're so easily influenced you know um, that they they know exactly what they're doing and I think there's there they ought to be responsibility um, placed on these companies on the kind of foods that they're promoting. And it's great to hear that um, Boris Johnson has announced to end um, online junk food advertising, because I think that is the biggest way that the food industry is able to manipulate young people. Paul, what do you think? Do you think these, um, this legislation about junk food advertising, I mean, I, I'm really impressed that you've got it off the tube and, I, and it's great that we're going to go below the nine o'clock wash shed. But I mean, these companies are so smart. They sort of wriggle around every back door or front door that they can find. Well, we, we've got to set regulation and we've got to set the rules and then we've got to have, you know, a body with teeth to, to impact people that break the rules. It is, it is complicated. It's not just simple binary black and white. There's all sorts of foods that will fall into high fat and salt and sugar that, that, aren't, that aren't, um, aren't consumed by young people. But, you know, I would start from the position of, um, Let's think radically. Let's just let's start a conversation. Why on earth is anybody advertising anything at all to children? At all, not just unhealthy food. Because children don't have an income, generally, they can't work, they have no legal redress, they cannot sue. Under 18 year olds can't sue a company, so they can't do that. They have less life experience and therefore are going to be more exploitable as to understanding whether something is trying to sell them something or something is um, a, 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 at arm's length and just informational. So those environments where children are exposed to every day, you know, I start from the question, why do we have anything at all that children see that is designed, because it works, as, as Tasha so eloquently said, um, wh why, why don't we start thinking of that as a society? I think we've got to change the reframing of us as a society. You know, it's easy to say the government over there, well, we elect a government and they should represent us. And if we think it's unacceptable, that 40% of children in London are at an unhealthy weight, which will shorten their lives, which will make their lives poorer and not allow them to live their potential through no fault of their own, just because of the environment that they're growing up in. In the fifth richest country in the world and, uh, and all of the resources that we've got. If we as a society think that that's okay, then we should elect governments that propose that, that, uh, that keep that going. If like, I'm sure the vast majority of people, when they stop and think about it, think that's not right, 
then we've got to empower and encourage brave governments, whether that's at the local level, and I'm a big fan of, of local um, government action. Mm. As I said earlier, I think the best decisions are made closest to where the problem is, or at the national level, uh, and demand that they're brave because this isn't the sort of society that we want. Um, and and it, so in many ways, it, it comes back to us. So, so, I mean, just to put it out there, I, I'm not suggesting ultimately that all advertising to all children for everything would be bad. But if we start from that position, if we take ourselves out of the frame that we always speak about of, uh, 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 of accepting things as they are, then, you know, my, my view, my view of bringing an entrepreneur in to be the chair of, a, of London's Child Obesity Task Force. I'm so grateful that they did that. I'm so surprised in a way that they did it. But I mean, my, as an entrepreneur, I'm saying we've got to try, try things that haven't been tried before. Some of them are going to fail. If they fail, that's okay, because we can learn and we can adapt and we can make new policy and new ideas from it. But if we always do what we always did, we're always going to get what we always got. And we've got 40% of our children in London being an unhealthy way. That's not good for them. It's not good for our community or economy. So what have you done or have you, what have you got in train that you think will work as a disruptor to this horrible pattern um, that you are in fact able to do at the moment because I, I know how difficult it yeah. is to get laws changed. Well, the way I look at it, there's, there's three sort of areas we can, we can affect change from. We, we can call on the government to set rules and, and, and to seriously drive change. We as individuals, we as communities, we can use our wallet, we can use our voice to affect change because businesses will chase profits um, and, uh, and media will chase uh, interesting voices. And the other angle that's often overlooked in this is the sort of investor in the financial community, which I think is crucial to this. I've recently been involved with share action in uh, demanding of Tesco that they set healthy um, food, a portion of their sales that are healthier foods uh, as, as a goal, as a, a strategy and report and, and account for, for them hitting that at their upcoming AGM. And they didn't like it, but they've accepted it. And they've set a really great target by 2025 to have 65% of everything that they sell as food to be healthier. Okay, Tasha, what would you like to see in your local area that you think both the local community and, well, and the, the local government and the national government need to do specifically so that we wouldn't have to make that film again in 10 years time? I mean, that has to be everybody's aim that we're not here again. Yeah, that is such a big question. Um, so many answers, I guess. And I think in terms of what I would like to see in my local community, it's almost um, linked to what Paul is saying, just having, putting a spotlight on healthier foods. Because at the moment we have highlighted unhealthy foods through, you know, having price promotions for them, um, our high streets only offering one option. I think we've just normalized the consumption of junk food. So for me, it's almost, you know, like reversing the current state of status quo. And that actually let's focus on placing these price promotions on junk foods let's prom, uh, focus on making healthier um, healthier food options more affordable for uh, for everyone really not just young people um alone but i also think um to what paul was saying you know where we can say to get to a point where we can say us as consumers we can essentially put our money where our mouth is that can only happen when we're given true choice and true option when you know i can have an equal i can make you know a conscious decision between having an unhealthy food option and a healthy food option and not be influenced by social media and not be influenced by advertisements and not be influenced by any other external factors but really have that choice which i don't think um um that we truly have but i also just to touch on what paul said earlier you know why do we even advertise to young people uh, to young people or children at all we have we have to really um remember the impact um or the power of pester power the ability of children to pressurize their parents into buying a, a particular product and that is one of the strategies that the advertising industry really uses you know when you see a pack of um chocolate with your favorite disney character when you see a, um some yogurt a yogurt pot with a pepper pig that is not because you know children inherently you know come into this world loving chocolate or <laughs> loving yogurt no it's mm. because these companies know that if you place your favorite character um children's favorite character on this product automatically children want it and I'm able to pressurize my mom or my dad into buying it so definitely controlling that that environment really does play a role into you know kind of changing the current status quo that we have yeah yeah I'm Rosie, whether I could just share some thoughts on ideas practical ideas that aren't too difficult that government could take and, and, and business is already taking um to 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 solve to help solve this um thing mm. I think 
we're looking for ideas, aren't we? We're looking for agents of change, how we can force change. One, one of them is through business. You know, there's a brand new business that launched just this week called Smash, which stands for Save Money and Stay Healthy, which I'll declare I, I'm really interested. I've invested in and I chair, but it's an app that for 13 to 24 year olds that they can use wherever they buy food that offers discounts on, on the healthier options that they can take when they, when they buy their food. So it will make healthier choices more affordable and accessible. And hopefully by next year, sort of wherever on the high street, young people go to, to, to get food, um, they'll, they'll change their behavior because they're saving money and they're being able to eat healthily. Now that will show that we'll be able to take evidence to government to show that if people have a discount, they'll change their behavior. So please, 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 it's ridiculous that you don't, that you have VAT on healthier food. The dynamic you've got at the moment as a government is VAT is a hot versus cold sort of uh, choice. Um, and it should be healthy versus less healthy. So, you know, taking evidence to government and say, now reframe what VAT is about. If you make healthier food 20% cheaper by taking VAT off it, then people will buy it, young people will buy it. The government also has levers to do with the tax system, which you build on the sugar levy, which has been successful. I've spoken about supporting small businesses. I think we've, we've got this opportunity away from food to water uh, in this country. So many empty calories are consumed with, with fizzy drinks. Yeah. I think we should have a culture and it's been so, so relatively easy to do where free water is just available everywhere for all of us to fill up our bottles with. In public buildings, we can just nip into a library or a, a council building and fill up water. There'll be water fountains outside. All restaurants should serve free water as a uh, as an option when people go in, that will take lots of calories out, and that will that will that will be uh, uh, such an easy thing to be able to do. So, the government's got so many things at its fingertips that it could start doing, but it all has to be coordinated, uh, and not just taking one sort of policy of will 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 address advertising uh, now and, and ignore everything else. It has to be a holistic whole system approach that they need to take. Yes, and, and I mean the, the government really hates that because. They want to be able to pick off one thing and say they've managed to change things, but food's very complexity makes it tricky politically and therefore unpopular politically because certainly when you see it in a green context, it isn't like let's all switch to electric cars or, or whatever, or let's all bicycle. They're, they're kind of one box solutions that you can tick. And food, unless you do a lot of things, you don't move the dial. And that is always very complex. It's not an excuse for doing nothing, but it's an excuse in a odd way, I think, for the government to constantly throw the ball to another department. And I mean, Tommy, do you think that it is um, that you could, what do you see as ways out of this that are doable? And, and I would come back to Paul in a minute and say doable in what time frame? Well, I think it's really fascinating that um, that concept of, of advertising and in the film, they looked at what would blank packets of, of really unhealthy food look like. And that is something that no kind of sane person would think is a possibility. And yet look at what we've done with smoking. Look at the fact that all cigarette packets are now kept behind those closed bars. Ultra processed food is, is killing 90,000 people a year. And, and I can't, I, you know, that fact, it, it shocks me so much. And in a time when we've just lost so many people to COVID and there's such a link to that, how can we in the fifth richest nation in the world accept that and when we know that all that food that is being advertised with the kind of teddy bears and the monkeys straight at children when we know that food directly leads to death later on how how are we even how is that possible that those companies were allowed to one target and i'm really interested in that thing of no targeting to children at all as a parent mm. it sounds brilliant but but you know that if cigarette companies aren't allowed to do it then how is it possible that these companies and and we know with ultra processed food it's not even in the nhs's it's not a, a kind of it's not an accepted term now but the ultra processed um definition is when a food entity has more than five you know man-made ingredients in it and it's very easy to see what these um ultra processed foods are we know there's this direct causal link so i think if we could somehow tackle those foods which we know are complex knitted kind of concoctions that basically bind soy or wheat into some type mm -hmm. of what looks like food but what practically has no nutritional um, element to it and is really detrimental to global warming 
So, so there's, it just feels like that's quite a good target. Uh, and the advertising of all those foods just has to stop. Well, they have done it in Chile. They have taken the Tony the Tiger and things like that off Frosties and children have really turned away from them and they started to market in blank boxes. It's been incredibly controversial and the governments come under extreme lobbying, but there was this very far-sighted health minister that could see this damage. So you can do it. Uh, all of these things are absolutely can do. I remember seeing the, the guy, the G general medical officer, Liam Donaldson, not um, shortly after he had introduced the smoking ban and him saying that he'd stayed up all night the night before because he was in such fear about what the public reaction would be to the announcement of the smoking ban. And he said it was absolutely extraordinary by lunchtime. I was the most popular man in England <laughs> because actually everybody wanted it. Everybody was sort of begging for someone to say, let's do this. You know, this is this is insane. We shouldn't go on doing it. And I feel that, you know, we have to get to that public tipping point that on the day they say, OK, all HFSC food is either banned or taxed extremely heavily or comes with a big warning label on it or a combination of some of all the all those three that it would be incredibly popular with i mean no mum wants their kid to grow up on unhealthy food but coming back to the film this is what you see as a reality for people it, would that be right tash that it is you know and i understand you're a stressed busy mum trying to hold down a job you don't have much money you don't have the room for choice you have rubbish cooking conditions you can't you can't afford to buy in bulk you're dealing with the um, how expensive it is to be poor because you buy in small quantities. It's not surprising you end up at the chicken and chip shop several nights of the week or with the local pizza. Um, I'm very sympathetic to it. I think it's a very difficult problem. Um, and what would you what would you want to see us do, Tash, at this point? Honestly, oh, such a heavy question, Rosie. Um, so for me, so one of the reasons I joined White Back was because I wanted to change the narrative when it comes when it comes to talking about obesity. So for you know, most of the time when we talk about childhood obesity or just adult obesity and overweight, um, it's always, oh, it's your fault, you know, you decide what you eat and all of that. And I do recognize the level of accountability. But for me, when I think about, you know, 20, 30 years ago compared to now, it's not that people have gotten greedier or lazier over these last um, you know decades but actually recognizing that the food environment in which people have changed um, and people live in has dramatically changed so for me it's about recognizing these changes so like you mentioned recognizing that actually people don't have access especially young people don't have access to these um healthier options it's not affordable for them to even choose these op healthier options if there are available and we're even talking about convenience often you know fast food is either you know, delivered to your, to your doorstep, it's probably five minutes away from your house, or you can chuck it in the microwave in a couple of minutes, it will be done. All of those different factors play into the kind of food that you're eating. So for me, it's also about, you know, um, I, I think Tommy, you alluded to it earlier in that education plays a big role. A lot of the things that I know about nutrition, I did not learn it at school, that's for sure. Um, I went out there and I did the research or somebody told, told me about it. And I think that's how I've been able to acquire this knowledge that helps me to make these uh, better options. So also placing an emphasis on educating young people, children about nutrition. So, you know, when we are faced with the two options that we know which option is better for us. And if that option is priced appropriately, I'm more likely to buy it and if that option is very close to my house again i'm more likely to buy it again so many different pl um factors play into the kind of food that we we are eating it it I does seem laughable to me that for so long the government has seen eating well as a kind of luxury as a kind of add-on for the, this kind of fun the idea that in schools they don't tackle food or food education seriously or that you know that it's important to have a canteen in a hospital so that as a nurse, you're not more likely to be obese than any other person because you literally don't have access to good food. I mean, how is it that that's an afterthought when it's completely linked to mortality, you know, early mortality in our population in the fifth richest country and directly linked to climate change? Well, I think that that's um, now our time is sort of up and I'm incredibly grateful to you all for 
all those amazing ideas and indeed problems that you've laid out, but also a lot of solutions. Paul, thank you so much for all the work you're doing. And I'm really interested in the hearing about Smash. That's such a good idea. And Tommy, thank you very much for Chefs in School and all the work that is done and that you do around obesity. And Tash, as ever, thank you for your youth campaigning and bringing us very much up to date with what it's like on the lived experience, because that's the bit that people all too often forget in this debate, that this is a real problem. I hope that in 50 years time, we'll look back on this as a sort of weird aberration of something we once did in the same way that we once took fossil fuels out of the ground and thought that was perfectly okay as well. So thank you all. I'm going to hand back to the British Library, thanking them very much for putting on these series of films and debates. And I hope that uh, lots of people will listen to this and give them some clues as to how they join us in this incredibly worthwhile, in fact, quite essential imperative campaign. Thanks so much. Rosie, you've been doling out the thanks, but I think the thanks go to you for um, steering us through that uh, discussion brilliantly. Um, there wasn't lots of time to talk about all the issues that the film's raised, but I feel that that half hour or so was uh, incredible, actually. Thank you to Paul, to Tommy and to Tasha, uh, mainly to Bike Back 2030 for working with the British Library Food Season on today's event. Um, I think we've shown that this is urgent. It affects us all. And while the problems can seem so big, there are solutions out there to be grabbed. Um, thank you so much to KitchenAid for supporting the work of the British Library Food Season. Uh, that's it from the food season for this year. We are done. Been here since the uh, middle of April. It's now the end of May. We've had 20 or so events covering such a range of food issues and voices. There is an archive on the British Library website, the BL Player, if you'd like to catch up on anything. There's some really great stuff there. Um, I'm going to give the last word to Polly Russell, who is the founder and curator of the food season. But uh, for me as the guest director, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Angela, and thank you to Bite Back and to our panellists for a really fantastic discussion about a really vital issue. And it feels like a fairly fitting place to end the 2021 food season, discussing something which really impacts on us all. So thank you so much. I also want to thank Angela Clutton for being the most wonderful guest director across the season. I want to thank Unique Media, my colleagues at the British Library, and of course, our sponsors, KitchenAid. This brings the 2021 food season to an end, but we will be back next year. So goodbye and thank you. <laughs>